us. Good morning. Joy to be with you. There's a, a few people absent today. There's one or two of our number that are at home. Um, so we uh, pray for them. Welcome to you as well if you're watching uh, on Zoom or Facebook or whichever it is. And uh, I just pray that we all have a blessed time of fellowship here. We obviously have a lunch in a little while, which is uh, to be looked forward to, and uh, the fellowship that we can have then. I'm going to start by reading a few words from Psalm 56, and then pray, and then we're going to sing. Uh, Psalm 56 says this, Be gracious to me, O God, man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, but when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. What can flesh do to me? In God I trust, what can flesh do to me? I pray it is to have a God who knows more than just our flesh, who protects more than just our skin. Let's come before him in prayer now. Father God, we thank you that we can gather in this place today, that we can gather online too. Lord, we pray for those who are at home watching this service um, unwell. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you will restore and bring healing there. Lord, we thank you that as we at times in this life feel oppressed, as we feel afraid, as we fear sometimes maybe for our lives in certain situations, we don't need to worry because our flesh is not all there is. We have a spirit that can live on for eternity with you. A father who has sealed us by his son. Lord, help us to trust in you. Help us to lean on you in our darkest times. Help us to come to you. And there's moments of desperation. But help us to come to you in joy as well, recognizing that all good things Come from you. Lord, I just pray that you'll bless our time together today. Help us as we look into your word. Uh, may it enlighten our lives. In your name. Amen. This morning we're going to return to the Gospel of Matthew and pick up in Matthew chapter 10, uh, where Jesus sends the uh, apostles out uh, on a specific mission that we're going to think about. And they face trials on every side. And we're going to sing a song now where its words say, When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. Sometimes the outcomes we see aren't the outcomes we expect. But we know they're what God wants. O oh, church, arise and put your armour on.
just have two notices to mention uh, before we continue. On Tuesday evening, we will return to having prayer meeting in person. So at 7.30, we will have prayer meeting here. It will also, God willing, be on Zoom. Uh, for those that can't be here physically, uh, please continue to join on Zoom, much as we do on a Sunday evening. But it would be good to see people here. We'll meet in the church building um, because of the technologies in here. And Saturday morning is the church breakfast, uh, where the men will continue looking at the cross of Christ. I can't remember which chapter we're on. I'll send an email out as early as possible this week. And ladies will continue looking at the new book that they're looking at, which title I can't remember. Um, but if you'd like to join us for the breakfast, or the Bible, or the book study, I suppose, or both, uh, please do put your name down on the sheet at the back. Is that right, Pat? Yes. If you're just coming for the, the, the book bit, you probably don't need to put your name down because he won't feed you. Uh, but it's good. Full breakfast to start a Saturday. Young people, we have almost 26 letters to get through. So let's go very quickly. I have a clicker in my hand. And it worked. A. I'll start with you, Isaac. Ant Samuel B. Bear. Well done. Tavish, can you remember C? Camel. D for Dominic. Hey, that worked. But dear. <laughs> for those that didn't hear, Dominic just said duh to me, which I think is a mark of my lack of intelligence, isn't it? Uh, Artorius, E. Well done. Eliana, F. Fox, well done. Can I come to you boys? What do you reckon? James, G. Nat, well done. Daniel, do you have any idea what H was? Horse, good man. Isaac, back to you. I. Insect. Samuel is there for a J. Oh, you can't read. Well, you can. Samuel. Jackal, well done. Tavish, K. Dominic knows. He's whispering to you. Whisper louder, Dominic. Kid, well done, Dominic. L. One of you two. <laughs> Leviathan. Well done, Eliana. Good girl. Uh, where are we up to? L M. Artorius. Moth. Good. N. Boys, can you remember N? Daniel, do you know what N was? A bit of a cheeky one. Did you say no? Net full of fish. Well done. I'm not worth clicking now. I don't know. James. Ox, well done. Uh, boys, go on, just shout out. Anyone anyone who knows one? Pardon? Pig? Quail? Ram? <laughs> Scorpion? Ten ants, well done. And la two weeks ago, two weeks ago, the ugly cows uh, from Pharaoh's dreams. Right, this week is... The letter V. Does anyone know an animal in the Bible that begins with the letter V? James is being whispered to. What, what have you been told him? Okay, no. <laughs> Samuel. Vulture. Vole. I think there are vultures mentioned in the Bible. I couldn't see vole, but maybe there's vole like creatures. Arturius? Vipers, as in the snakes. Any other animals that begin with the letter V? Samuel? I've got a clue. Are you ready? It's been said. Does anyone know what that is? It's a very specific type of car. Now, when I was a teenager and I used to play top trumps, do you know what top trumps are? This is the car that you wanted in the car's top trump because the power was amazing. It's called a Dodge Viper. Now, obviously, there's none of those mentioned in the Bible. They're about 2,000 years too late. But there are Vipers mentioned in the Bible. Arturius, you said, what is a Viper? It's a type of snake. Now, I'm not really very good with animals, but I don't think they're big snakes. 
A viper is a snake that we don't have in this country, as far as I know. And it is an adder a viper. Okay, we have some fairly safe vipers, so don't, don't be scared. Adders, they hurt a little bit, but not too much. But vipers generally, their bites don't hurt that much. The thing that hurts, they, 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 they're poisonous. And where Jesus was, they would have understood what vipers were, and they would have understood that actually the poison in it could really, really hurt. Jesus calls a group of people vipers. He says that this group of people are like poisonous snakes. That doesn't sound like a very nice thing to say to people, does it? Now, these people are called Pharisees. And we know lots about the Pharisees. But in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew uh, tells us that the Pharisees thought that Jesus was actually an evil person. And that they told people that Jesus was sort of uh, of the devil, from the devil. And Jesus says to them, he says, You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? Jesus, the perfect person, says to these, this group of Pharisees, you vipers, you snakes, you poisonous snakes. Because what they're doing really, they're trying to look good, they're trying to look innocent, they're trying to look perfect, but they're telling people what to do, but actually what they're saying isn't a good thing. They're telling people to ignore Jesus, which is the exact opposite of what a really good believer would do. They didn't even believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They thought that he was someone come to cause disruption. And they wanted rid of him. But they were quite subtle about it. They didn't try and attack him or hurt him. They just slowly, well, they did hurt him in the end. But at this point, they were slowly, subtly trying to get rid of him. So Jesus called them a bunch of poisonous snakes, a brood of vipers. Go away, he said. Now, it's true that today lots of people don't, don't believe in Jesus. Lots of people try and undermine, try and ignore the truth, make Jesus sound unbelievable, but they're entirely wrong. There's only one person that is good, there's only one person that is perfect, there's only one person for us that's really worth listening to, and that is Jesus. People try and tell us otherwise, like Jesus, which is trying to ignore them, turn away from them, listen to what the words of the Bible says, rather than them. Does that make sense? I don't know. I went a bit over. over. Now, I normally at this point say, if you see a cow, remember this. I don't want to say if you ever get bitten by a snake, because I'm sure none of you ever will. But if you see a little grass snake or something, remember, Jesus told the Pharisees to go away because they were, they were claiming he was a bad person, when actually, in fact, he was good. We're going to sing a song now. I can't call it a hymn, a children's song, uh, and it's I Will Praise the Lord Every Day. It's on video, so if you don't want to sing, no one will know. Um, there are actions on the video, so if you feel compelled to do the action, do so, but don't if you don't want to. From my head to my shoulders, from my knees to my toes, I will praise the Lord every day. Thank you, Martin.
Someone tell me, surely we've just sung it 43 times. Artorius, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, we should. If you are a young person, it's time for Sunday school. Or Brenda or Pat. Uh, we're going to sing uh, a, a proper song. Uh, tell out my soul uh, the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice. Tell out my soul. chapter 10 and the first 15 verses the first 15 verses I think uh, Jean thank you um, the Bible reading is from Matthew chapter 10 and it's on page 814 And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for the labourer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, 
Find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Thanks to Jean uh, for bringing those words to us. We, we return to Matthew this morning and we'll look into those words uh, in a few moments. Before we do, uh, let's uh, come to the Lord in prayer once more this morning. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we come to you humbly. We come before you recognising that you don't need us. We are not good enough for you to come before you as sinners and fallen people. And yet, Lord God, we come before you. We are trusting in you. Counted as righteous in your sight. Justified through the blood of your Son dying upon that cross. Lord, we cannot do anything of our own. No work of our own can bring us favour with you. Lord, we pray that you will help us in our pursuit of living holy lives. We pray that you will help us to live a life that you would be pleased with. Help us to recognise that we can do none of that without your strength and your help. Lord, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who before time began was part of a plan that would redeem mankind. With the sacrifice was made 2,000 years ago, the pain that was caused, the humiliation that was suffered, also that we could be brought back into communion with you. Lord, what a plan, what a sacrifice, what a love displayed on that cross. Help us as a church to tell people of this wonderful news. Help us not to keep it to ourselves. May it be life-changing. May it change our outlook, our attitudes, our expression. May your love so fill us that it pours out from us. And may people notice. May people take notice and want to know what it is that gives us this hope, peace, joy, love. Help us to be embodiment of the fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> Lord, as we recognise our weakness in regard to, to sin, we recognise our weaknesses, health. We understand that there are various members of our congregation, our, our fellowship who are unwell this morning. Lord, we know that there are some at home with COVID. We know that there are some who have had struggles for a much longer period. We recognise that you are a God who sustains, a God who gives everything that's needed. Sometimes it can be difficult to recognise that and remember that. Sometimes, if we're honest, it can be difficult to believe it. Lord, I pray that you'll help us. Help us to rely upon you and lean on you in every situation. When we are tested, when we are tempted, help us to look to you and your word for our guidance. Help us to trust in you and you alone. So we do pray that there will be healing given to those that need healing, comfort to those that need comforting, strength to those that need strength. Lord, we recognise too that we are not a church here alone. And I thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ across this world. We pray for those in Ukraine. We pray for those in Russia who don't agree with what's going on. War has been going on so long that it's sometimes easy that uh, we accidentally start to forget about it. There's war across this world and other places too that maybe we don't think of as much. And we just pray for those that are directly caught up in that. We pray for those Christians across this world who are persecuted, those who are suffering for their faith, those that have to hide their faith. 
Lord, we pray for churches near us too, and it was so good to be able to meet with churches from across Ipswich on Tuesday evening. We pray for the work at Whitton. We pray for the new pastor there, Cole uh, Maynard, that he will settle into the work and that he will be able to witness in that area. We thank you that they had a, an open event last Sunday. Many people in the local area went to that church. We pray that there were seeds that were sown there that may grow and flourish and to prove uh, repentance. We we'll pray for that. That's at Shepherd Drive and uh, Puddle Hall Road and uh, Zor and Somersham too. And we just pray for the believers there that they will be able to witness to you, work for you, and that we may see and hear of great blessings in those churches. And Lord, we pray for ourselves as well. Lord oh God, we are so often slow to learn, quick to forget. Lord, we face days where to pray seems so difficult. Where to love as you would have us love seems out of our reach. Lord, the time we waste in foolish pursuit, the time when we don't rely upon your word, when we don't take time to take in your word, help us to remedy those problems. Help us to make our pursuit of you our biggest goal. Love, knowledge of your word. Help us, Lord, to increase in grace. And help us to come before you in constant interest, relying upon our Father God for all that we need and all that we want. Help us to recognize your ultimate wisdom for all things. Help us to live looking ahead to that glorious victory that's to be revealed in us as we receive that crown of victory in your name. Amen. As we, before we look into God's word this morning, we're going to sing uh, once more. It's the tune of Be Thou My Vision. Uh, the words are slightly updated, they mean the same thing, um, and I am 95% sure they fit the tune. As it were, oh, you are my vision, O oh, King of my heart, nothing else satisfies, only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, your presence, my light. Challenging words.
and as I said earlier, we are heading back to the Gospel of Matthew. We've had a, a brief pause uh, in the book of Ezra, and now we return to the Gospel of Matthew that we have been looking at uh, for a few months. Much of this book written uh, by the disciple Matthew is building up towards the last few verses where Jesus says to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. And if the disciples were to teach the next generation what Jesus had commanded them, they would command them to teach the next generation what had commanded them. So therefore that commandment continues through the, the Christian generations, for want of a better phrase, through to us. That should be our mission too, to make disciples of all nations, to tell people of the love of God, baptizing them, celebrating with that witness, that example given through baptism, teaching people to observe all that Christ commanded. As we look through this gospel, we've seen over, we saw over the, a few weeks, a great period of teaching, uh, as we call the Sermon on the Mount, through chapter 5 and 7 of the book of Matthew, which kind of culminated in the parable of the man who built his house upon a rock. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, we read, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And in verse 28, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. Through Christ's teaching, he demonstrated the authority that he had and he told those that listened, this great crowd in the end, to build everything they do, to build their lives upon his word. Matthew doesn't end there. He continues to give us accounts of many times when Jesus proved his power, his authority over everything. And in verse 8 and 9, we have a great list of people that were healed, of wisdom shown uh, through questions. And now we get to another period of teaching before Jesus sends his disciples out. It's a bit of a transition period in the Gospel of Matthew. It goes from being all about Jesus working pretty much by himself. Jesus picking this first group of people to send out to continue his work. It's no longer just Jesus doing everything. It's going to be his followers working for him as well. Before we begin to look into too much, we notice this group of people have two different names. In verse 1, they are called disciples. He called to them his 12 disciples. Disciples literally being a follower. One who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he had many disciples. But they were also called, this group, apostles. Verse 2 says, the names of the 12 disciples Apostles are these. Now, apostle really means messenger, representative, witness. In this instance, it is someone who was specifically assigned to do the Lord Jesus' work. This is this account uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it appears in all three. It's really the only time we see the phrase the 12 apostles used in any of the Gospels, is in relation to this account. Later on in Acts, we see 
the name, the word apostles appear again in the book of Acts, is often called the Acts of the Apostles. And that word signifies a very special role that those 12 people, and at this point we include Judas, later on we take him out, or he takes himself out, and we include Matthias and uh, Paul. Those people had a very specific role to play in the early church. And we'll come back to that in a few moments. At this point, we may come to Scripture and ask ourselves, what is it saying to us? But so often it's important to think, what did it say to them before we make it about us? And this passage we have to be very careful with because there are some things that are specific to this group of apostles. So as we begin, there are three differences between then and now. Differences between their mission and ours. Firstly, we recognize that this group of people had a very specific apostolic authority. They had a very specific authority given to them. Verse 1 said, he called to them his 12 disciples, specifically the 12 and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. And now there may be some that disagree with me on this. Please uh, speak to me later, lunchtime this afternoon. But at this point in time, these apostles were given a very specific mission. Later on, Jesus gives authority to bind and loose sins. We read in Uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. In Acts, we see the authority of Christ displayed through their ability to preach the word. But at this point, and at this point in time, these apostles had, as we read in verse 8, authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. How great it must have been to witness all of that. Now we may ask ourselves, why don't we see that now? Why can't I, as a pastor, raise the dead whenever I want? This is a very specific time and a very specific mission. If you read the book of Acts, many of the times when we see these great miracles, who were they performed through? They were specifically performed by the Holy Spirit through those apostles. I struggle to think of a time when they're done by someone that wasn't one of those apostles. You'll probably tell me about 23 later. It's a challenge for you. Is it now that God is less powerful? Not at all. The important thing all the while was that God's word became, came first. Jesus said in verse 7, Proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he said, Heal the sick, and so on. Very often the healing, the power displayed, was a a demonstration of the power and authority behind those words. And you can think uh, back to the lame man that was brought to Jesus uh, by being lowered through the roof. Jesus said, "Your your, your sins are forgiven, the Pharisees are aghast. Jesus says, well, what's easier to say, take up your mat and walk, all your sins are forgiven. They agreed that it would be difficult for Jesus to prove, uh, uh, to say, stand up and walk without clear evidence so he says stand up and walk and the man can walk and that walking is a demonstration a proof of the authority that Christ had it was done as a proof of his teaching you see we today are in are in an entirely different time to the apostles we have the full authority of scripture behind us we can read of God's great redemptive plan we can see the power displayed by him through the acts of the apostles, through the gospel, through all that Christ did. The apostles couldn't go around and quote from Philippians because it hadn't been written at that point. We are living in very different days. We have all the proof we need of God's power in Scripture. If you were to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 later, and you read of the signs of an apostle, and then if you go into 1 Timothy and read the qualifications for an elder, 
you will notice great differences. At no point in the qualifications for an elder or a deacon or a leader, uh, in any of those uh, pastoral senses, does it say, and he should be able to raise the dead, heal the sick, and whatever. They're right in front of me. I could just read them. Cast out demons, cleanse lepers. No, it says, a man must be temperate, given to drink, able to teach. We're in very different days. So as we read of this mission, we have to remember that we are in different days. And we have to remember that these apostles were given a very specific audience. Jesus, in verse 5, says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At this time, Jesus sent his disciples only to the Israelites. In fact, there was probably no danger of them doing otherwise. If you remember, Peter uh, was reluctant to go and see Cornelius until he'd seen the, the sheep of good food and things coming down, um, or, and those things coming down uh, from heaven. It probably didn't take much persuasion for the apostles to only go to the Israelites. That was where they felt safest and cleanest. But at this point in time, Jesus was telling them, only go to those uh, to the Israelites. In Matthew chapter 15, which we'll come to in a few weeks, and verse 24, we read Jesus is, as he's talking to a Canaanite woman, a, a non-Israelite. And in verse 24 he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, Is it not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. See, Jesus came predominantly to speak to the Israelites. First and foremost, to speak to them. However, the plan was, and we see this picture through the book of Matthew, that Jesus would redeem Gentiles too. But the Israelites were God's chosen and special people uh, from the days of Abraham onwards. The disciples were given a specific mission to go to the Israelites. Some may say that our mission should be to go to Israel and, and try and have all of Israel redeemed. And I would say to read through the book of Romans and you'll see that that's not the pattern of the, of the new covenant anymore. The Gentiles have been grafted in uh, to Israel. So there was a very specific audience that doesn't apply to us today. Did Jesus say, go and make disciples of all nations? We also see some very severe consequences for all these apostles. Uh, briefly, verse 9 and 10 says, Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And we'll come back to that in a bit more uh, in a little while. But the picture there is of men being sent out in pairs, we presume pairs, with absolutely nothing, just the shoes on their feet and the shirt on their back, to rely upon the goodness of those around them. And if you read that verse and think that that's how the Christian life, the Christian mission is going to have to be, it could cause us trouble. I definitely own more than two shirts, uh, for example. But this was a very different time again. And actually, these apostles all faced great hardship. We're fairly sure from history that only two of the apostles weren't killed by others. John uh, lived his days out in exile. And Judas killed himself. The others, we, we believe, were, were killed by people through spears, beheadings, and crucifixions, and um, various other stories, depending on uh, where you read it from. The apostles faced severe consequences, and the apostles had a very hard time of it. And yes, it's true that we will be persecuted. Yes, it's true that we may face hardship, and there are Christians around the world that lose their lives. Today, that's not the, the normal. One would assume that most of us in this room will 
end our days relatively peacefully and go to heaven. That would be great. It may be that we suffer to the point of death for our faith. But it's not the normal pattern. So there are three very clear differences between then and now that can all be backed up uh, with, with scripture and that we see the pattern of. And we could then question, well, how does this chapter apply to us in any way if you're saying that they were sent out on a very specific mission? Where there are some great similarities between what Jesus preaches now and what he it says as he sends, uh, as he, through the Great Commission, as he sends all believers out to the world. How does this apply to us? And you can already see uh, the answers on the board. On the screen, sorry. Um, have it. Um, <laughs> how does this apply to us? Firstly, we have a similar motive and means as the apostles had. Our mission, our task is to go into all the world, telling the gospel, baptizing believers, teaching people all that Christ had commanded. And we have a similar motive and means. And we're going to go back into chapter 9, actually. Uh, chapter 9 and verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. They were harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. And uh, we've, we can see a description of the Israelites uh, in, the, in the Old Testament as being sheep without a shepherd. They were a group of people that had been led astray by bad kings, by bad leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the high priests that, that couldn't agree on Scripture. These were, were God's people that had been led astray and he had compassion on the crowds and therefore sent his apostles out. Don't we have compassion on the crowds as well? As we look around the world and we see those that are lost, those that are heading towards a, a terrible eternity, we should have great compassion for them. The love we have for other people should compel us to tell them the good news of the gospel so that they may be saved through the work of the Holy Spirit. Our motive is compassion for the crowds. What means do we have? We have the Holy Spirit. We're sent by Christ. Yes. But Jesus in verse 38 of chapter 9 said this, Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. The apostles needed prayer and people. As do we. We need to pray. Every great revival that's ever happened, well, most great revivals that have ever happened have started with a small group of people praying in a room for revival. Prayer is the great power behind the church. But we need people too. We need people that are prepared to go. And that doesn't mean go to a country that's far away. It doesn't mean go to a difficult place. It might mean that. And it might be that you are feeling called to go somewhere. And I would beg you to, to listen to that call. But we all have a mission field. I may have mentioned this before. A few years ago, we had, when I was at, at Blackfield, we had a couple of American pastors came over. They were going to do a joint mission. Um, it, it didn't happen. Various reasons, COVID being one of them. But one of them was shocked that I'd never been abroad as a Christian to go and do a great mission. You know quite well I've rarely been abroad for any reason. But he was shocked that I hadn't been. And every year they go to Cuba or something and, and do a bit more building. And I tried to persuade this, this chap that I spend two weeks on a field about six miles away from my house. And that, to me, is a, is a great mission field. And um, I'm saying, I don't think he agreed with me. And that's fine. That's his opinion. But we all, no matter where we are, have a mission field. It might be that our mission field is the cul-de-sac that we live in. It might be that our mission field is the, the office that we work in. We all have a mission field and we need people to go into their mission field to take the gospel. It's a great honour that we are chosen by God 
to take his word out with us. Prayer and people. Secondly, those people don't have to be great people. We don't have to be great to reach the least. And we see that as we read through the list of disciples. The names are Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. If you ever question whether you are good enough for God to use in any way, read through that list of 12 names. Uh, Douglas O'Donnell says this, Here we do not find Peter the Great, Dr. John von Thunder of the Dubigan Institute of Theology, or St. Thaddeus of the Holiest Order of Most Holy... holy combining words. Uh, St. Thaddeus of the Holiest Order of Most Holy... I can't do it. Of Most Holy Hermits, is what I was trying to get out there. Most Holy... I, no, I'm stopping there. Never again am I reading that quote. But it's true. We don't see this list of great people. We see a list of normal people. Normal people. So we don't need to feel inadequate if we are feeling normal. In fact, the only descriptors that are mentioned, other than family relations, son of Zebedee and brothers, is Matthew the tax collector, who would literally have been seen as a traitor to the Israelites, Simon the zealot, who would have been so passionate about getting rid of the Romans that under no other circumstances would he have got along with Matthew the tax collector, and we see Judas. What's Judas's descriptor? Who betrayed him. And yet he was sent out by Christ to do a mission. If you're not feeling good enough to do God's work, if you don't think you're intelligent or articulate enough, read that list. It's not true. We can all do a work for God. There was a, a comment yesterday. We um, had a Pioneer Camp Day uh, where the, many of the leaders gathered together and we met here. And uh, Peter Newton from uh, Shepherd Drive came and spoke at the end of the day. And someone uh, commented that they felt a bit sorry for Peter Newton at the, uh, during that because they were sat when he was speaking and they realized that in the, the congregation of only about 30, 35 people, uh, the proportion of pastors, elders, and deacons of churches was quite, quite high compared to what you would have in a normal circumstance. Now, I'm sure Peter was absolutely wonderful with that, but quite often, if I'm preaching and you walk out of the vestry and you walk into church, and sometimes you notice there's a, a, a pastor who's on holiday and they, they've come and sat, sat here uh, in the church, you instantly, my, my natural thought is, well, why don't you come up here? and I go and sit there, because everyone will get on much better. It's so easy, in whatever role we play in the life of the church and in God's work, to feel inadequate and not feel good enough for the task that we've been called to. The fact is that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're not relying upon our own strength. We are normal people. We are ordinary people as the apostles were. Read what they did. Read of the greatness of their work. So don't worry if you feel your normality is a hindrance. Uh, thirdly, and getting there, sorry, dependence upon God through others. Dependence upon God. Those that seek to do God's work must depend upon him. And there's two, two parts to this. I said uh, earlier that gospel workers now, anyone who, who seeks to take the gospel to the world doesn't need to impoverish themselves and walk around barefoot um, with only one shirt that they've had for, for seven years. But they do need to rely on God. And, and Christ gave that picture of his, his apostles going out entirely impoverished so that they would rely on upon God. That had to come through other people. The thing is, if we start to rely upon ourselves, if we start to rely upon our own means, it might skew what we say, it might skew what we do. 
It might mean that we start to worship idols, money, popularity, rather than worship God. The fact is, in all work that we seek to do for him, we should rely upon him and him alone. We should remain humble, recognizing that everything comes from him. And I firmly believe, although I don't think it says it in this passage, specifically, I firmly believe that we shouldn't seek to become rich off the gospel. But this is twofold. Very clearly, Christ tells his apostles, the laborer deserves his food. So there are some that are set apart, that specifically labor in a certain way, which means that they wouldn't be able to have gainful employment in, in other areas. But they deserve their food too. They deserve to be fed. It may be that you feel the call to, to give up the work that you do so that you can focus your time on telling people the gospel raising disciples, teaching God's commandments. But yes, you need to rely on God. We should be supported by other people too. The labourer deserves their food. So it may be <clears throat> that instead of being called to go in, to go without money, that we are called to be givers instead. If we want to support God's work and the work of the gospel, we must do so financially too, so that people, other people don't have to worry about secular work, they can focus on God's work. Sorry, I've got myself in a bit of a muddle. Um, I don't really like talking about money in that sense, if I'm perfectly honest, but it's true. And I love that the church here is prepared to give away uh, a percentage of everything that comes in to support the work of mission. And it was so good to hear um, Stephen Musa Kumar a few weeks ago and see how our support of him impacts the work that he seeks to do. The labourer deserves their food, but we should all depend on God. We shouldn't go and tell people the gospel in the hopes that we get rich. As believers, we are to be sacrificial in our time, in our money, in our resources to enable God's work to continue, whether that's specifically through us or through other people. Fourthly, we see a Christ-like character is commanded. The humility that's displayed as people tell others the gospel shows a Christ-like character. In fact, our character commends Christ. And we take that from this verse 8. You, and he says this to the apostles, you received without paying, therefore give without pay. You've been given so much, don't expect stuff back from people. There is a great sadness in the church as a whole that many people see church as being something that seeks to take their money. And we look at, I, we went to Ely recently and I, uh, we, I, we, we saw the cathedral, this massive building. And it must have cost the people a fortune. Also, really, they may have said they were seeking to glorify God. But in reality, many of those buildings were probably built to glorify man, glorify people, show how powerful they are. The church isn't here to take money off people. The church is here to tell people the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and to tell them uh, the wonderful commands that he has given how we should, in fact, instead of seeking to make money off the people, we should seek to have a sacrificial attitude. And that will be both a welcome and a witness to those around us. I love the passage in Acts, Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 46, which is a picture of the early church. It says, day by day they attended the temple together. They broke bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Whatever they had, they, had, they were glad and generous with it. They praised God and they had favor with all the people. The people saw what they were doing 
and they were impressed by it. It was different, it was countercultural, it wasn't all about money, it was different. We also see this Christ like character being commended in verse 16, which was just after where Jean read to, which says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The world is being described as wolves, those that will devour. The church is being described as sheep, vividly different. Sheep, peaceful, vulnerable, dependent on the shepherd. Wolves, fierce, strong, dependent on themselves, living for their own gain. However, there's a limit. We shouldn't be fully sheepish. We're not to be foolish and timid. We're to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The imagery of serpent is linked to wisdom and doves. Uh, uh, innocence. I read this week that it's actually easy to be as guilty as serpents and stupid as doves. We should be the other way around. Wise and innocent. Sheep in a world of wolves. Our character, our graciousness, our peace, our dependence upon God shows other people God. Our character commends Christ. Uh, drawing to a close, we see that the disciples were given a very simple message as well. Uh, verse 5 said, "Go." no, it didn't, verse 7 said, proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here, the king is here. That's what you've got to tell people. A clear announcement. Through the book of Matthew, we saw, we have seen that phrase over and over again. <clears throat> people through history have sought to change that message. Uh, God, in so many instances, is seen as a, a crutch that can be lent upon. People forget that God is king, that God has authority and will be a judge. His kingship and his judgment are important, but it is a very simple message. Summed up in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believed in him will not perish, have eternal life. And the converse is true, those that do not believe in him will perish and will face eternal torment. The message that the disciples had was simple. And it's a very simple message that we have too. But finally, it's also a divisive message. We've, saw, we've seen that picture between sheep and wolves, different creatures, different worlds. The apostles, as I've mentioned, all faced great torment. There were some that turned their back on them. And it may be, and it's such a challenge when we, when we summon up the courage, the will to tell people of the good news about Jesus, even to tell people that we go to church then the first thing they do is ignore us or turn their backs on us. And it knocks us. It makes us think that maybe we shouldn't bother again. But the apostles faced it. These men of great power experienced that rejection. They experienced humiliation. They experienced death for their cause. So we shouldn't be surprised at the message we bring at times divides. At times these people want to turn their backs on us. People want to live for themselves. People want to live for the here and now. People want rewards without anything else. People think that they can seek good things by their own power. John chapter 14 and verse 6, as we all know, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Everything else is wrong. Our message will be divisive. People won't like it. They didn't like the apostles' message. You can't expect it. The disciples were given <coughs> a very specific mission, but there are many similarities between that and ours. As we close... What are we to do? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all 
that I have commanded you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the mission that you've called us to. We thank you for the mission field that you've placed us in. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to be fearless in our deliverance of the gospel. Help us to recognize that some people just won't listen. Help us not to be dismayed or despair because of it. Help us to take great joy in seeing people turning to you. Lord, I pray that you will use us all as normal people, normal individuals, to unite together as part of the church to unite together in this mission of going into all the world and telling people the wonderful news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, be with us today, I pray. Help us as we have fellowship now. Help us during the week. Good morning. Are we going to sing one last song? The Lord's my shepherd. I didn't know what songs were sung last week, but I've been reliably informed that I think this is the final song last Sunday morning. Is that correct? It is. Um, the Lord's my shepherd. I'll not want. from Jude, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever.